Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what time zone you're in or when you're watching this. I am Cindy Campbell from Clovis Pause for Play Dog Training. Yes, I am rebranding. And um, I'm here with Penny Beeman and to, with Service Dog Handler Chat. Our topic today is different types of training, different training styles. We'll go that way. Um, we want to go over a few quick rules. Generally, we want you to stay muted unless you've been called upon to ask to ask a question, answer a question, make a comment. You can also put questions or comments in the um, chat box. We will be monitoring that. If you have a question or comment that you feel is a little bit more urgent than the chat box, you can also use your um, Life, your um, reactions to raise your hand, and that will what that does is that moves you to the front of the queue, so we know where you are and that you have a question, and we will address those. Uh, we do ask that you remain muted throughout the conversation unless it's your turn to talk, because it even background noises can set off some flashing that can be difficult for our um, viewers that have seizure disorders. This is being closed captioned for those that have hearing issues. And um, in general, we want to just make this a very fun, welcoming group and meet you where you're at. So I'm going to turn this over to Penny unless there's any, and let her start the chat from here. Thank you. And my screen doesn't switch. That's right. <laughs> so I am Penny Beeman from Uber Paws of Love, and today we kind of want to just have a group discussion based on different training journeys that we have all taken. Every person has an individual story and maybe in a different place. So for the most part, everyone who has watched any of the service dog handler chats in the past knows that we are very committed to force-free training. But we didn't all start there. So just to give a little bit of a background, I'm going to go over some of my story. So I started with, um, you know, kind of the, f I had dogs all my life as a child. Don't need to go back too far. My first owned dog as an adult was a German Shepherd that my husband brought home when I had three kids under the age of four, <laughs> well, five. So one of them being just three months old. And my husband brings home a three month old German Shepherd because he wants to protect the kids. <laughs> so not quite my ideal situation. And at the time, all I had had was the experience of watching older family members. I mean, I interacted with our dogs a lot because I've always been loved dogs. But, you know, watching older family members, which trained with the basic alpha style of showing the dog who's boss. And so when the first dog entered my life, we were very much that way. However, she was a very, very easy dog. She trained really quick, really well. And so I don't think, I mean, while we did use corrections and the alpha kind of thinking, nothing we did was extra harsh with her because she trained so easy and was just an awesome dog. <laughs> so um, next dog was a little bit of a different story, was another German Shepherd. And this is where all of the bad habits that I had seen in previous family members really came into play. Um, and I didn't know any better, um, didn't use anything super adversive, but had done the, you know, the alpha roll and definitely leash corrections and that kind of thing with that German Shepherd and really didn't realize my errors. He was also a very fearful dog had a lot of fears, and I really never addressed those fears. I managed them the best I could. He was awesome obedience-wise as long as there wasn't a fear present, and when there was a fear trigger present, he was a totally different dog that just got managed, and we never addressed it. 
I just didn't have the skills. So fast forward a few more years and I had an awesome therapy dog. So of course she was very well trained. And again, like the first dog, a very easy to train dog, but she kind of taught me that dogs could be more than the dogs that I had grown up with. You know, um, I was amazed at the amount of training she was able to retain and the things that I was able to train her to do. And I was basically an unskilled trainer at that time. <laughs> so she, she just kind of opened my eyes to the world of dog training and the possibilities that existed. <laughs> and then um, from there led to my world of working with rescue dogs. And again, taking in rescue dogs, at first it was very alpha geared, um, you know, showing them who's boss and give it to My job was to take the most challenging of rescue dogs that came in and spend about six weeks getting them ready to be adoptable. Penny, I think you froze. And I'm back. I did. <laughs> and I'm back. And I apologize for that. Uh, my cell phone flakes on me every now and then. But so uh, when I started with the rescue dogs, and it was my job to take on the most challenging of dogs, and I had uh, six weeks or less to get them ready to be adoptable. So while that started with the previous alpha training that I had had, I quickly realized how real fearfulness and anxiety was to these dogs. So while I still didn't understand the whole force-free philosophy at that point, I saw a need to be as kind and as loving and working to build their trust in me before I tried to teach them anything at that point. So that was kind of my first step. And at that point, I would consider myself more a balanced trainer. And um, the term balanced kind of has different meanings. But to me, it, mean, it means basically using both. Or some people refer to it as using all four quadrants. But to me, at the time, all I really knew about was you used positive reinforcement or you used corrections. <laughs> Plain and simple, two options. And a balanced trainer did both. So that's kind of where I would have considered myself at that point. And then Cam came into my life. <laughs> and most of you have heard me talk about Cam quite a bit. He is my nine-year-old German Shepherd, was the last foster dog I took in and came in through this rescue. He was never really planned. We weren't looking to take in a foster, but an extreme situation came up animal control was about to seize the dog owner therefore then tried to hide the dog by giving him to me but I was working through the rescue and the rescue knew what I was doing all along and so therefore animal control knew what I was doing all along but so with Cam it was very apparent that all the wrong things had been done to him um Horrible muzzle training, as in forcing a muzzle on his face and walking him through crowds of a thousand plus people when he was fearful of people. <laughs> um, boyfriends coming and going and not so nice when he was fearful of men specifically. Uh, trying to expose him to other dogs, which only led to more dog fights because Cam was very dog fearful. Separation anxiety causing him to break out of the house go going through glass windows he learned how to open the windows first and when the windows were wedged shut so he couldn't open them he simply went through them because his separation anxiety was so bad so by the time he came to me he was only in my care a day or two before I realized how extreme his trauma was he was 45 pounds instead of the healthy 90 pounds he is now um, just so completely malnourished, horribly, 
you know, lack of training specifically, but just horribly handled inappropriately the first two years of his life. And so while I'm not opposed to muzzle training, <laughs> at the time I completely threw his muzzle away. It was a demonstration to him. Look, this will not happen again. <laughs> he watched me put it in the trash. He watched the trash go out to the dumpster and out to the road. And, you know, as a, an example of, I will not do that to you. And that was kind of my real first commitment to being force free, even though I really still didn't understand what that was. <laughs> um, there has been a time or two where I may have pulled his leash harder than I should have before I knew what I was doing, that kind of thing. But I have always been dedicated to using as little force as possible with him. And then um, my next dog, we also had a dog, Isis, in that time frame. That was my son's dog. And he trained her a little bit more harshly than what I would like, but he also was very good with hand signals and kind of opened up that whole world to us. Um, but so, I mean, she was, she was just an incredibly smart dog that also taught us there was more to, we were training, even if we weren't training, we were training <laughs> kind of thing. But so then that led us to my very first service dog. And that is really when my eyes opened. And I'm going to do a shout out here, which I very rarely do, but I have to do a shout out to the OTSD um, service dog group, the owner trained service dog group, because that is really where my whole eyes open to how extremely important it was to be a force free trainer when you're training service dogs. So from there, that led to multiple other trainers that shared that philosophy. And then my true understanding of what that really means to be force free. And then going through my certificate program for the advanced animal behaviors and really understanding that whole operant conditioning, counter conditioning, behavioral side of things, really, again, just reaffirmed that yes this is what I want to do and then that led me to the whole um, dog-centered care um, channel um, it's a Facebook group and YouTube channel directed by Andrew Hale and so a shout out to him as well because he's actually what inspired Cindy and I to start these service dog handler chats and we talked to him a little bit before getting started, and then he's joined us on chats and things as well. So um, shout out to Dog Centered Care. Uh, eventually, I will post a link to that in the comments. <laughs> uh, so to me now, what that means to be a force-free trainer who cares more about the dog's needs means that I'm not going to use corrections or harsh means. I'm not going to do anything that forces the dog to do what I want them to do. Instead, I'm going to look at the bigger picture of why the dog's behavior is what it is. You know, what is the emotional side of it? What is the physical health side of it? And what is the past experience side as far as like what have they been trained to do what have they been what have they been reinforced to do whether it was intentional with cookies or unintentional reinforcement um you know what has that past history taught them that is acceptable or appropriate or encouraged and kind of looking at that bigger picture so that is my training journey and I don't want to spend this whole time talking about me. I know we have several other trainers in this group. I kind of posted three training questions in the chat. Um, you can choose to answer one, two, or all three. Um, at this point, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you want to answer that verbally. And if you don't want to keep your hand down or you can also type your responses in the chat 
We have plenty of time because we're going to work through the raised hands first, and then um, we'll kind of catch up on whatever's posted in chat at that point. So Cindy was first. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Cindy to kind of tell us about her training journey where she started. Okay, so I've been training, working with animals since basically my time began on Earth. We've always had animals. When I was six, we moved from a city residence. We had like three quarters of an acre, but we and we had chickens and iguanas and fish and some big dogs. We had a Great Dane and a standard poodle. And when I was six, we moved from that situation to a rural situation because my parents decided that we needed horses. And um, that is where my training journey really began because the horses led to sheep, led to cows, led to ch more chickens, led to each of us having our own dog um, and a variety of other things. And this was back, I'll date myself, this was back in the 70s. And there was only one way to train animals back there unless you worked at a marine park. That way to train animals was pop jerk was the traditional way or what we tend to call now alpha theory or dominance theory where the dog the animal did not have an option but to comply whips and spurs were common with horses um you know management wasn't it wasn't about managing it so that the dog was comfortable it was about managing the dog so that it wouldn't do what you didn't want it to do and it would comply with what you asked it to do. It was very different than it is today. Fast, um, my first dog as an adult was trained using very similar methods because the trainer I found was teaching through the local um, adult education program. And while she, I have a lot of, I have tremendous respect for what she has done and can do with dogs. She's still a dominance-based trainer. She trains extensively in Schutzund and um, protection sports with her dogs. And even though people think that that's how you have to train with protection dogs, it's not the case. They have, it's been shown that you can have just as drivey and just as, if not more drivey, more dedicated dog using positive reinforcement and um, with your dog to achieve any number of things. It's still certain circles tend, most circles of dog training still have a lot of the traditional aspects. It's getting better. Um, I would much rather see somebody popping cookies in their dog's mouth and not relying 100% on pop and jerk and alpha rolls. But, you know, there's still people that think you need to stick an e-collar on to teach a um, hunting dog how to hunt. And that's not the case either. That's been shown as well. So about 20 years ago, I was in a similar situation to Penny with, I had two under three. And we had two huskies that lived outside that had health problems that developed where it ended up, we had to put them both down within a two week period. When it had a severe stroke and couldn't function as being a dog, even an outside dog, which she was predominantly. And, we and the other one developed a cancerous growth under his shoulder blade that was the size of my fist and the that said, well, we can amputate and put him on chemo and that might last another six months. And I'm like, no, he just had his sister put down. We're not putting, and I have two little kids. We're not putting the dog through that. So we ended up having both those dogs put down within a two week period. And somehow within two weeks of those dogs being down, I ended up with a Newfoundland puppy that was a pretty special puppy. Um, I just happened to find her, but she was the great niece of Josh, the Newfoundland that won Westminster the year we got her. So it was pretty cool bragging rights to have, to be able to say, yeah, well, you know, when somebody said, oh, what a pretty dog. I was able to say, well, yes, she is. Thank you. 
she happens to be related to Josh that won Westminster. So that was pretty cool. Uh, but she opened my eyes to a lot of things. I went and worked with a different trainer this time, that time with her. And I worked, the trainer I worked with happens to be a good friend of mine now and is still doing a lot of training, but she opened my eyes to what was then called clicker training. And I don't want people, I, there's a distinction to me between positive reinforcement training and clicker training. Clicker training is marker-based training, but it does not guarantee that there's not corrections involved or harsh corrections involved. And what I have found using positive reinforcement is it reduces or eliminates the harshness involved in training. It should eliminate it. But we're humans, we have emotions, we tend to get upset sometimes. But the idea is, you know, when you're using marker, when you're using reward based training, you want to make it fun for the dog. Well, then several dogs later, so, you know, 20 years and several dogs later, along comes Nick. And Nick, I asked specifically for a high drive poodle, but Nick is more than a high drive poodle. He's also got some, a lot of attention issues. And um, he's not been the easiest poodle to have. And then he had some other bad encounters at critical times in his life. And he's been a challenge through all of that. However, he's now, as a result of doing force-free training, positive reinforcement training, and good management, He's an excellent house dog, and he's turning out to be an excellent service dog. It's, you know, we all start on a journey, on this training journey somewhere. And one thing that I have really noticed is when you're asking your dog to do stuff, advanced training, that's probably some of the most advanced things you're going to ask a dog to anybody's going to ask a dog to do if you think about what what a service dog has to do it has to be able to perform its tasks in any environment under any circumstances and it has to have complete trust in you that you're not going to hurt the dog or let anybody else hurt the dog and if you're using harsh corrections and you're doing things that harm the dog and the dog, especially if you have a smart dog like Nick that can figure, that is problem solving smart, which our service dogs become because of the way we train them. You're not gonna be able to use corrections, very harsh corrections. You can use negative reinforcement because that will show, you know, you have either, or um, what is it, not negative reinforcement, negative punishment. You wanna use positive reinforcement and negative punishment. Negative punishment just means you're taking away something the dog wants, you know? So like you're playing with Nick, I play a game where we throw a toy and he brings the toy back to me. And then I ask him for a behavior. He wants the toy thrown. And he, but he's not going to get the toy thrown until he does the behavior. Technically, I've taken the toy away and I'm not giving it back until I throw the toy. So that's um, negative punishment. I've taken the toy away, but then I get the behavior quicker. I think we need to recognize where we're at, where everybody's at. You know, I, I've used prong collars in the past. I think they're better than choke chains, but I don't like either one of them. Um, but I also think that you can do as much or more damage with a flat collar if you don't train your dog right. So, um, you know, it's because it's just, it's how in, it, a lot of tools are, it's how you use them. But what we found is that you don't need the harsh tools. And, and I don't want to use those with my dogs. I have sensitive dogs. Even Poe, as you know, tough as she is as a great Pyrenees, does has always been raised with positive reinforcement training and she has oh you know she she'll test me but she it's a matter of learning how to make how to deal with the dog what need what needs management and management's not a bad thing um it's an a very appropriate thing and 
using appropriate management to manage a situation while you train your dog and train for the situation, not in the situation, is huge. That's my opinion. I know everybody's on a different spot on their training journey, but I, I'm finding that the more you're using positive reinforcement and rewarding what you want, it re and brightening those pathways really makes your dog want to work with you more and makes your dog want to learn more. Elliot? So for, for me with my training, similar to Cindy, always worked with animals. I was, it was really my job to take care of the animals as a kid. Um, and I loved working with them. I was always fascinated with their behavior and often understood it way better than humans because I'm autistic and animal behavior makes a lot more intuitive sense to me than human social behaviors. <laughs> so I kind of always had that special interest and I it never made sense to me that anything I read on dog behavior was dominance alpha based training especially when my very my young very wolf obsessed self had already read the paper that debunked dominance theory in wolves that came out in the 90s so i'm like well if wolves don't do this dogs why are we basing dog behavior off of fake wolf behavior and then as my parents my mom really loved to watch Caesar Milan and his tactics and I could not stay in the room and like I could not handle seeing those approaches to the animals I'm like it's very clear this is a stressed animal and it's getting more stress like you can see it in the show why are you watching this and that always became kind of a point of contention listening to their boundaries, reading their body language, giving them choice, giving them that bodily autonomy. And I've very rarely had, you know, had difficulties with fearful animals just being able to feel safe around me because I would give them that space as a kid, even when I wasn't like actively training the animal, but I was going over there to like feed the animal while their owner was out or whatever. Um, Vibrations. It's just, you know, feel it, feel it at its highest setting. It doesn't hurt. You know, I'm like, okay, but that's right on the neck of the dog. And it's still a very unpleasant. And I could see that, you know, the dog would re As well, if the collar is on, I have to listen. I, but if the collar's off, I'm not listening to you at all. And the dog, you know, had no trust. The dog did not want to listen. And like, that's what they had trained it to. And meanwhile, my, you know, and this was a dog that came from a good breed. you know, use so much negative, you know, all this positive punishment with the e-collar. Meanwhile, I got an adult mature Sholo who had been rehomed twice before coming to me. He was raised primarily in a kennel. He's been to show rings, but he did not have proper service dog socializ socialization or anything like that. And then you know, all I've done is constant positive reinforcement for him of lots of patience, lots of coming to his terms and, you know, 
he didn't have that positive upbringing that a service dog normally has, but he's still been able to get to this point because all I've ever done is let him build his confidence and let him feel safe. And so, like, he is a primitive type breed. He is prone to skittishness and fear and all these things, but he's grown to be confident because he's been taught the world is a safe place through constant patience and love. Whereas this dog that was, you know, a lab type being raised on an e-collar was taught the world was terrifying and he didn't have to listen. You know, he's supposed to be an easy dog to train, but punishment taught him otherwise. So to me, like, there's no clearer breaking point between what love and punishment can do to easy or difficult dogs. And yes, there are exceptions to every case, you know, there are some dogs with extreme behavior needs and the like, but as a general, that, you know, just pure training won't help because they need medication, etc. But as a general rule of thumb, love, patience, building confidence can really transform a, a dog from fearful to confident. Okay, so thank you, Cindy and Elliot, for letting us know a little bit where you are. And I know Ashlyn had said that she's always been really positive reinforcement training. Um, they had a family pet before they got Lily, her service dog, and her parents were more punishment-based, so she kind of understands that. And Thankfully, we do have a lot of people, and Ashlyn, I'm not trying to say you're younger or not as important, <laughs> but we do have a lot of people now in the younger generation that have that never really grew up using alpha training, and for that, I'm thankful. I would like to see more of that, <laughs> and I would hope that future generations, you know, a few generations down the line, that's all that they would know is positive reinforcement training. So some of it is age and not realizing that there were better ways. Positive reinforcement didn't exist when I was a kid. You know, I'm sure there were people that did it, but we didn't have the internet. So we sure didn't hear about it. <laughs> so that was really big. So part of the reason I wanted to do this chat today is because we all do have a different training journey. We all have been a different place. And so... There are a few places, um, and most of you know, face Facebook has good places, bad places, all that stuff, and I'm not going to throw any groups under the bus, but I know that there are a lot of service dog handlers specifically that have been treated badly in service dog groups on Facebook, and I'm sure other social medias too. I'm just not real up on other social medias, but so they've been treated badly which kind of started me to start the Working Paws group, which then started this um, service dog handler chat that we do, which then started the Crazy to Calm Canine Coaches. So that in itself has been its own training journey. But so I really pride myself and the other admin as of the Working Paws group, I know do the same in that we always have working paws as a safe place all of the admin understand and so do most of the members that understand that everybody is on their own journey and you don't know what you don't know it simply doesn't happen so you can't know that you're doing something wrong if you don't know that what you're doing is harming your dog and you can't change that unless somebody is kind enough to take the time you need to show you the better ways. Thankfully, I've had some great mentors that have done that for me. And now it's the point where I can now be that mentor to other people, which we try to do a lot in our classes. We try to do that a lot in our groups and other things of that nature. So it's just really important to me. And if you're watching this and you're not part of the Working Paws group, and you're looking for that safe place where you can ask your questions, then I always put a link to the Working Paws group and the Crazy to Calm 
website where you can see um, all the trainers that work with the canine coaches program. So you can get to those and see resources that can help you on your force free journey. So that's my little tangent of the day. Um, I'm going to go to Cindy so that she can explain next uh, or so that she can say why your hand's raised. But before I do that, I just want to give um, kind of a um, next question, <laughs> if you will be. So it's kind of a two-part question again. But so what has been your biggest challenge in your training journey? Like maybe what one habit have you had the hardest time breaking, even though you knew there was, it was something you didn't want to do kind of thing? So what has been your biggest thing that you had to change about yourself as a trainer to follow your force-free guidance? And um, where do you see, you know, is there a step, is there a next step for you? Is there somewhere you want to go from where you're at now? And so Cindy had her hand raised before, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Cindy. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. So I just wanted to say something real quick about Lima or um, what is it? Le Least intrusive, Least moderately intrusive. aversive, something yeah. like that. And the reason I want to say this is Lima puts you on a slippery slope. And it's not necessarily, I'd much rather see a Lima trainer than a, you know, somebody who's saying balanced or traditional trainer. Because the idea is you are still trying to use the least aversive way possible. The problem that it gets into is a lot of people will go down the slippery slope of Lima and all of a sudden they've got, you know, e-collars and prong collars in their Lima toolkit using them on a routine basis. And we don't, you know, I don't want to ever say that's the way you have to do something. I would much rather say, you know, let's try this, let's try this, let's try this and keep practicing because even though it doesn't feel like you're going to get someplace, you are going to get someplace and keep doing the stuff that you, you know, pl keep playing the games, keep working on rewarding the behaviors you want and managing the behaviors you don't want. So they're not being rehearsed. Um, that being said, probably the most difficult thing for me to deal with going to um, Penny's question, I think that probably the most difficult thing for me to get past, and this has been an ongoing struggle, and it's one of the reasons I prefer a hands-free leash, is I have a very hard time not having a tight leash because I have one dog who likes to lean in. She, she goes, oh, sniff. I want to sniff this. I want to sniff that. And she happens to be a rather large dog. She does have good collar responsiveness because if she really wanted me to go someplace, I'd either have to drop the leash or follow her. Um, she's also standing here being very pushy, staring at me because she wants cookies. Um, yes, I know you do because I got the good cookies out today. But, you know, it, it's really especially when you have a dog like Nick who's super athletic and all over the place and literally would run circles and bounce and meerkat and do all these other behaviors that were made it almost impossible to manage his behavior on leash when he was a puppy and I didn't have the option of just letting him go in the back putting him on a leash and going and having him go potty in the backyard and work on leash manners there um it can be really difficult to get rid of the, if you've ever had the tendency to pop and jerk a leash or have a tight leash, it can be very difficult to get rid of that habit. And I found that using a hands-free leash has really made a huge difference for me in that respect, because if you drop the leash, you can't correct the dog. And working off leash when possible in a safe area, like you don't want to be working in a parking lot off leash with your dog, period. Um, 
However, there's usually some place you can find a fenced field or some place where you can work your dog off leash. But really, that has been a challenge for me because, you know, I grew up with horses that would you know, try and, you know, they knew they were stronger. My horse growing up, when he turned his head, I couldn't do anything about it. Um, so not being able to, not, learning not to pop them has been a very difficult thing for me to do. And especially since it was years and years and years of training of pop the animal with the leash or the lead rope, it has been a real challenge. And, you know, it, it doesn't mean, you know, even no matter how much you brainwash yourself not to do it and you practice not doing it, it doesn't mean it's never, ever going to happen again. But it's something I definitely try to avoid as much as possible. Elliot? You have your hand up, Elliot. Yeah, Tabitha raised her physical hand, so. Okay, go ahead, Tabitha. So I don't know how Zoom stuff works, and I don't know how to raise hands on Zoom. Um, yeah, not my generation. I'm not young yet. Um, but as far as, well, let me even pull it up. Cause FYI, y'all, I'm not in a great brain today so i apologize in advance if anything comes off like no filter because today is a no filter kind of day and i apologize all right hop into the chat for the questions so where did i start i started when i was like 15 with a rescued german shepherd who outweighed me by like 10 times and my dad slapped a choke chain on him and told me that's how to walk him and I remember like my first winter with him, he saw another dog and he was reactive and he dragged me probably two blocks on the Joker. Um, like skinned my knees, I was a hot mess. Um, and then I didn't really learn a lot. I was decent at training dogs, but I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know why what I did worked. I definitely wasn't aversive per se, but I did use a lot of like body pressure and almost, if you're familiar with horses, almost Pirelli-like training, but in dogs. Um, not ideal, obviously. One second, I have to yell at my kid out the window. Not really yell, but get out of the dirt. Okay, sorry. Um, and then when I got my first dog, I was just barely over 18. I rescued a four month old. We don't know what, probably whip it Catahoula lab thing. Um, and I started training her and eventually she became my first service dog. And I clearly remember being told that she needed a bark collar because she barked when people came into my friend's house and I was staying with them because I was in between houses. And she was cuddling with me on the couch. Somebody walked in the door. She jumped about a mile in the air after she barked, yelped, and hid under a table. She wouldn't come near me for hours. She wouldn't come near the couch for days, if not weeks. And that was when I said no. And that was, I was like, I don't, I didn't know or understand things back then, but I knew right in that moment that that would never happen again. And that I had to do better because she was my world and I had hurt her. And, you know, people think bark collars are like the most minimal on aversives or on because they're timed themselves and they, they apply their own thing. No, like, I'm sorry. I've now been training since crap 2007 officially, like training other people's dogs and my own, not including my shepherd five years prior. And I'm sorry, every aversive is the same. Whether it's a spray bottle, whether it's screaming at your dog and getting in their face, whether it's shocking them, choking them, pronging them, they all create intense damage. Maybe we can try and say, oh, some aren't as physically painful as others. They all do the exact same thing to our dogs. And they all ruin the relationships between us. 
and they can break our spirits just like they break their spirits, but they can't tell us if their spirits are broken. And it's become a driving passion in my life. And I am vehemently outspoken more often than not. <laughs> um, I am working on toning myself down on Facebook and such because, you know, pisses people off, pardon my mouth. But I I'm I'm vehemently outspoken. I'm sorry, a choke chain is not better than a prong. A prong is not better than a choke. Neither of them are better than a shock. Like, they all do the same thing. Citronella is just as bad as a shock collar. The ultrasonics are just as bad. They wouldn't work if they didn't do something harmful to our dogs. Vibration collars, same thing. Why does it work? Because it scares the daylights out of them. Everything works because we break down that trust and it's not okay to me. Like I have seen the damage that's done. I remember a quote and I can't remember the exact wording so don't crucify me for it, but it was something along the lines of, in order to use punishment effectively, you must have impeccable timing, perfect consistency, and there was a third ingredient that I can't remember. And if you have all of these things, then you don't need to use punishment. If you need to use punishment, then you need to be trained better or you need to understand psychology better. We can do better, you know? We may not have known better then, but we can do better. We There is no excuse once we know better to, to continue to hurt the things that are our lifelines. And as far as my biggest struggle, I, I kind of counteract my biggest struggle intentionally with my dogs. I, in addition to my physical issues, have pretty substantial like mental issues. <laughs> um, and I lose my temper and I swear and I yell and I freak out. So from a very young age, I teach my puppies that I'm a swear jar for two reasons. Number one, they learned that me swearing and yelling means they can come get a cookie. And number two, it's really, really hard to stay angry when there's a puppy wagging its tail in front of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> when they come and look at you so expectantly, like, yeah, I did it. I don't know what I did, but I did it. They get a cookie. And it kind of keeps my temper and my failures as a trainer down to a minimum because I've taught them that it's not them, it's me, kind of, if that makes sense. That might be personifying them a little too much, but yeah. You know, one thing I have noticed through this whole journey of um, going, learn, learn from going from learning traditional training techniques as a youngster in 4-H to where I'm at now is that if nothing else, positive reinforcement training, rewards-based training, games-based training, however you want, wh wherever you're at with that, tends to take a significant amount of stress and pressure off both the trainer and the dog when you can say, okay, he didn't, you know, he or she didn't do the cue because they don't know the cue well enough to do the cue constantly. To, you know, to do the cue at 90% in 90% of the situations. They don't know it. And that goes back to me as a trainer. And it's significantly lessened my stress. And it's significantly lessened my stress in dealing with anything in life. So just real quick. Um, sorry, Elliot, uh, you're almost up. I just want to let people know um ashlyn's biggest thing was also least corrections because that's how she saw her parents doing it and i'll have to admit that one was hard for me too and it is probably one of the biggest reasons why i use a hands-free leash and encourage m all of my working dog clients to use a hands-free leash of some sorts if they physically can because it just takes that right out of the equation without any um big challenges you know i do have a client and i'm sure she's totally fine with me telling her story but so as she gets more stressed her hand gets tighter 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 on the leash and she doesn't have any idea that she's doing it so her dog does wear a gentle leader 
the dog is conditioned for it and responds with it, with it really well. Um, the issue is that as her stress rises and her hand gets tighter and tighter and tighter up that leash, and she doesn't realize it, now she's putting more and more pressure on that gentle leader. So next thing you know, her hand is almost touching the gentle leader, and that's a great deal of force on her dog's nose. So for a while, I was constantly saying, let loose of your leash, let loose of your leash, so to the point I felt like I was badgering. And when I switched to, all right, hands-free leash, the only handle you hold is your forward momentum handle on or your balance handle on the side of the dog. You don't touch the leash that the gentle leader is hooked to. <laughs> You know, emergency situation and your dog is starting to drag you across the room because her dog does weigh more than her by like 40 pounds, then yes, grab it for temporarily, but let go of it as quickly as you have regained control of the situation. <laughs> Safety only. But other than that, let the hands-free leash do its job on the gentle leader. And so that is a really huge one. And so... Um, I'm going to turn it over to Elliot so that she can talk, and then I will tell you what my biggest challenge was trying to get back to force-free training or get to force-free training. Um, yeah, the, the leash corrections is also difficult for me just because I do when I get anxious. Um, sometimes I tick, and so I've been known to accidentally jerk the leash with for the same reasons of it removes any of that out of the equation on me because sometimes I move my hands without thinking and I don't want to do that but another one I found was thinking about that I've tried really hard to work on and sometimes still slip up on is not saying the dog's name in a really angry and upset tone um, especially when you're frustrated is a big one because that teaches that negative association with the name. And that one was definitely a harder one to break because you're not really thinking about it in that moment. It's just, hey, what did you do? And <laughs> But it, it's definitely something to work on not doing especially as much as possible because it does build that negative oh, i'm not going to come to you you're being mean right now and you know that's definitely a big holdover um that i found myself having to work on when i first started so yeah that voice and tone inflection is a huge one for me my biggest one was actually partnered with leash corrections but it is the um non-reward marker because with my leash pop before I knew better, I would also remind my dog with a stern verbal cue of easy. And so when I eliminated the leash pop, because I really, really worked on that, my voice still continued the harsh word of, you know, when they were pulling too hard, because I do like a little bit of leash pressure. For the most part, especially, I mean, my rural environment, we do a whole lot of outdoor freedom, sniff about kind of walks where my dog can be in front of me, beside me, behind me, wherever they want, as long as they're not dragging me. So in teaching that, I like that slight bit of pressure because that also helps me with the forward momentum. And so saying that harsh kind of verbal correction of easy was really, really hard for me to break. And I realized that with my first service dog. So I completely changed her word to something that I could not say in a harsh tone. And I don't remember what it was. It made no sense. It was something super silly. Oh, it's kind of where I started the goose faba. <laughs> off of the anger management because if I thought about it that's a, when I would say the harsher um be easy tone was when I was building in frustration and so that movie kind of planted that thought in my head of you can't be angry if you're saying the word goose faba and you can stretch it out really long and exaggerated if you're really worked up and need to 
And so I kind of changed it to that for my last service dog. And with Azul, I've been able to go back to the easy simply because that's what my family members go to first. And they'll do it without the harsh tone because they don't do it as often and hadn't built the harder thing. And I had broken that habit. I still do use the goose faba with Azul if I'm getting stressed or he's getting overexcited and I need him to take a chill pill. But for him, it's more of a tone it down, not I'm getting frustrated with you. It's like, as a team, let's just bring it back to center. And it usually involves some heavier praise and patting, whether that's a butt scratch or a belly rub or a ch chest rub or something to that effect. And, you know, the deep breaths that help us both to be a team in the instant versus going opposite directions. So creating that tension. Um, Cindy? So I just wanted to say I'm a big fan of the not of the of a uh, it, an, uh, an, a distraction noise or um, so but I make a noise as opposed to saying a word because I don't want a harsh tone I get so frustrated when I hear people just bark leave it at their dog and I've taught a different cue I go make a noise and when my dog looks at me they get a non they get a, a marker and they get a reward for that. Usually it involves them having to turn around and come back to me. So it's been really handy. Um, and I reserve leave it in any shape or form for when somebody touches my dog that has been instructed not to touch my dog, they get to leave it like hands off. And I can say it like I'm saying it to my dog because most people know or understand that that's what you're talking to. But they also tend to pull their hand back like, Oh crap! I just set. I just touched something I wasn't supposed to, and because the dog's just standing there going, "Whatever, mom." But um, I make a brrr type noise. Other people make a kissy type noise. I didn't want to do the kissy noise because I don't want my dog accidentally looking at somebody else when they make the kissy noise. But having something where you can get an atten you get their attention, making a noise that doesn't involve barking at your dog is extremely valuable. 